Hello. Hi, Sarah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, our February Guide Collective Book Club. Uh, we are now going to be embarking on our second book. Our first book, uh, for those of you who participated, uh, was The Sun Also Rises. That was, it's about, this Hemingway book about bullfighting, which was led by the most excellent uh, 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 Francisco Gloria. This <laughs> month, we are going to do something different. We're going to move over from Spain to Italy, and I'm being joined today by my friend uh, Susanna Peruchini, who is in Rome. How are you doing, Susanna? Buongiorno. Uh, buonasera. But buonasera, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> buonasera, everybody. I'm fine, thank you. Very excited to be here. So Susanna is sort of a, a newish uh, associate member of Guide Collective, and she's going to be helping us out with the book club this month and hopefully some other things in the future. Uh, and Susanna, just tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are in Italy. Well, I uh, live in Rome, uh, but I'm, I am originally from the north, from Padua, and uh, I lived uh, 10 years, almost 10 years of my life in Spain uh, that I absolutely love. Uh, so I am. Um, I find myself uh, uh, with one foot in Italy, one solid foot in Italy, and uh, another foot in Spain. But I'm 100% Italian. Well, technically, you're Venetian, then, right? If you're from Padova, right? Well, Padova is not Venice. So if you say to a Venetian that uh, someone from Padova uh, are just the same or neighbors, they would say, mm, I don't think so. But uh, we're close enough. Padova is uh, half an hour away from. Uh, um, from Venice inland. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful city and also very historical, uh, important university. And of course, uh, we cannot not mention the St. Anthony from Lisbon originally, but let's say from Padova Church. That is a huge church dedicated to one of the most beloved saints in, in Italy and outside Italy. And his thing is lost things, right? You pray to St. Anthony when you've lost something? Yes, yes, yeah. actually, is one of those that he will help you with the your uh, lost, lost and found, and also uh, if you are asking for uh, a good husband, especially for girls, let's say, looking for um, a good opportunity. So it is a kind of an important saint in many ways in the popular culture and also in uh, in history. Well, I think you and I are going to have to visit St. Anthony then in that case, but I had a St. Anthony prayer medal, but I lost it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> what a start. <laughs> anyway, okay, so you are coming to us live from Rome, though. You live now yes. um, on the coast near near Rome, right? Yes, yeah. No, actually, I live in Rome, in the city, uh, in the southern part of, of Rome. Yes, absolutely. And how is Rome these days? Well, is uh, hopefully uh, is getting better because uh, we um, moved i don't know if you're familiar with the uh, zones and the colors from uh, orange to yellow which means that we have a little bit more of freedom so uh, cafeterias bars are going to be open and you can actually consume and have a coffee or a cappuccino inside and not you don't have to just take it away that for us you know it's uh, it's not um something that we are used to. We have to become uh, used to that, but it's not something that we, we like. Uh, but in the past few weeks, we had to accept the fact that if we wanted to have a cappuccino or a coffee, it had to be to go. So, Well, hopefully we'll get back to the time when things are back to a little bit of normal, like they were when I visited you in September, so we can go back yeah, up. Yeah, crossing having... fingers. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we can go back to having our aperitivo out in Rome. Uh, so both you and I are um, tour guides in Sicily as well. And Sicily, uh, I think most people who know me know that this is one of my great passions. In fact, uh, one, somebody once said to me that the great love of my life is actually Italy and <laughs> Sicily in specific, which I would say is probably accurate. Uh, and I know that you also have a great passion for Sicily as well, right? Yes, despite the fact that I am um, a northern uh, woman uh, by birth, but it's also true that I always found myself more comfortable from Rome going south. And in fact, Sicily and uh, Naples, for example, uh, are very dear to me. So it's Campania in, in general, which is the region where Naples, Naples is, uh, is located, are very close to my heart. I, I cannot really explain, or I, I can, but with many words, but I found uh, in general that 
the southern part of Italy or the center southern part of Italy is uh, more suitable or um, simply um, for me it's it's easier to feel at ease okay so and in Sicily it's absolutely super easy um, even though there are little things that I don't uh, have in Rome or we don't totally understand because despite the fact that we are all Italians but Italy as you know very well Sarah it's so diverse so you can go from the Dolomites where the attitude and the atmosphere and the geography is totally different and then uh, in 1000 kilometers which which is a lot but not so much compared to the American standards you can find yourself in another world so Sicily is actually closer to northern Africa than to a big chunk of northern Italy and Europe and so it that's, is actually technically Africa when you're actually standing yes. on the the African yes. continental plate when you're in the southwestern part so yeah it is one of the the most beautiful and interesting places for me the reason that I am so attached to it is just that I think it's a deeply misunderstood place I think that we have, unfortunately, this idea, at least in the United States, everybody's watched The Godfather and they think <laughs> that that's what they're gonna find. Funny thing, actually, my kids watched The Godfather this weekend and my younger son was saying to me, cause they've come with me to Sicily and they've spent time with you know close friends and family there. And um, my son's observation after watching The Godfather was that he thought it was an insult to the Sicilian people the way that Sicily is presented as being this sort of backwards, not very nice place. And he said, you know, Sicily is such a fantastic place and it's portrayed in this movie, not like that. And that's kind of insulting. And I went, yes. <laughs> I <laughs> it is understandable. Well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the Naples South, that of course, historically, as we know, was the kingdom of the two Sicilies. It was the Bourbon King, so it was, all of that area was one country, not country, but kind of a principality. Yes. And so yeah. there is sort of, I think, a lot of common traits of people from those places. And, and one of the principal ones, in my opinion, is the warmth, the warmth of the people, right? I totally agree with you. Yes, the openness, the, uh, the attitude of being out and more open and more curious and interested in other people. So of course they can spot us and they totally understand that we are not from there, especially in Sicily, in this little uh, inland, uh, little places. But you know, what I really found fascinating, no matter if you are Italian from another part of Italy or from America or any part of Europe um, or the world is that there is this pure uh, and uh, really almost like childish uh, interest towards the others. So it's a curiosity that to me um, is absolutely amazing because in big cities in general and in the northern part of Italy, apart from the little, um, let's say, little towns, but there is, there is much more rush. There is a, a less time to be curious towards the others. Uh, I think that it's also, it's, it's a matter of uh, uh, time and having time to waste or to um, spend on others. You know, if you're rushing from one place to another, if you have uh, a busy lifestyle, probably you're not too interested in, in the others. And in Sicily, every time I've been there and I've been there uh, many, many times as you, Every time th there is something so endearing and so sweet about uh, uh, the uh, the approach of people can be old people can be even younger people. Where are you from? Uh, do you like our cappuccino? Or you know the simple chats that they uh, they really they're very good at breaking the ice, as I would say. Yeah, and I would say that that resonates a lot with me because the very first time I remember so strongly the very first time that I ever went to Sicily, and when you land, when you come into Palermo and oh, you yeah. land, it's the most absolutely incredible landing uh, in, in the world because that, that airport is right next to this real beautiful crystal aquamarine blue sea. And then you have these really dramatic mountains right next to the airport. And you feel like you've landed on the moon. And the first time I ever got there, I just felt like I had 
landed in a parallel universe somehow. And kind of like I had been in a time machine after having spent a couple of weeks in Sicily and gotten to know people and, and traveled all over the island. It gave me the sensation of being in a time machine because what you're speaking about is the way that people are curious and they want to talk to you and they seem very intrigued by visitors. It reminded me and also the manners and also mm -hmm. the sort of not caring what anybody thinks this is how we live and live with it kind of thing reminded me so much of living in Rome in the 90s. I studied in Rome, as you know, in, in, in what was it 25 years ago, more than 25 years ago. And I remember it was like living on another planet because it was so different to anything that I knew. Rome now is much like any other European capital and it's not like that now, but Sicily, it's, it's old Italy, it's the real deal. <laughs> that yes. was my impression. Yes. What yes. was your first impression the first time you went down there? Well, you know, my very first impression, it's, a, it's an old one because I remember many years ago, I was 12, 12, 13 years old, and my family and I uh, went to Sicily for two weeks for the um, Christmas vacation. We had our camper, so we travel all the way from Rome to Sicily, and I have, of course, my memory is not pristine, but actually it's getting worse by, by the minute, but I do have uh, the memories of uh, uh, like a I cannot explain, but it, it was like going, as you said, going back in time. And we're talking about, I was coming from Rome, which means that I was already in Italy. I was not coming from another country, but the sensation that I still have with me is a sensation to land in a, in a ancient, old and different uh, land and place. Um, I have some memories of going to, pastry shops uh, and people would do everything they could to let us let us taste uh, before buying and you know the generosity of uh, Sicilians uh, and of course we have to generalize uh, as in in these cases but it's incredible I mean they really uh, walk the extra mile they run the extra mile to uh, to make you feel that you they, they want you to know what they're making, doing, uh, thinking, uh, working on. I remember passing by, my mother uh, wanted to have a, um, a fresh taken from the tree orange. And of course, there were walls and walls and there were lots of uh, uh, trees, frutteti. Uh, and that was the right moment because usually they're picked uh, between November, December, okay? And uh, we, we didn't know what to do because we didn't want to steal. So we, we, uh, we knocked on one big wooden door and this man came and uh, we said, we would like to have one uh, orange to try to see uh, what it is, how it tastes. And he said, oh, you come in. And we entered, we went with a group of friends with the car. We were like uh, two or three cars, okay? And, uh, uh, in the end, we had the trunks filled with oranges. I will never forget. I will never forget. That sounds it was right, though. They didn't want to have a penny because we said, okay, one orange can be for free, but if you give me like five kilos, for example, it's, it's too much. And he said, no, it's not too much. So it was shocking, shocking for us. I think, I think what really underlay, is the underlayment of that is the common thread through every Sicilian person I know. And that is a deep passion, the passion for whatever they do. It doesn't matter. The passion for their island, for their identity and for who they are. I have never met a Sicilian who wasn't deeply proud of being from Sicily, deeply proud of whatever it is, the, what is that they do for a living. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter what they do, even if they just, you know, are cleaning bathrooms at a gas station. They're very, very <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> and that pride and that sense of, of passion, I think, is one of the things that really sets Sicilians as a character, as, as people apart, don't you think? Yes. Yes, I think, I think so. And on top of that, I believe that it's, uh, it's also a sense of belonging, you know, um, especially working and knowing lots of Americans, uh, friends and, and colleagues. Over the years, I understood that uh, what's some, you know, belonging to a family or being Italian or Spanish or Sicilian, 
it's something that from Europe, we, we know who we are from, right? Because we have always lived in a certain place or sometimes in a very limited area. And uh, on the other hand, uh, many of my American friends or colleagues or even customers that I travel with, they, they did not, and they had to dig into their, uh, you know, history, family history to understand um, their ancestors. They were coming from, uh, you know, from Poland, from Italy, from uh, different parts. And uh, to me, uh, what makes uh, um, the, the, the Sicilians an extraordinary people among the Italian people, because we are in the end uh, all Italians, is this uh, strong, extremely strong sense of belonging, which is very common in many people living in ancient lands, and especially coming from islands, because the same, uh, I don't want to deroute, but the same uh, uh, situation or sensation uh, I had many times uh, was with the Sardinian people. Uh, so Sardinia is another big island in, in Italy, and uh, these people, they have a, a super strong sense of belonging to their land. Uh, and in fact, they consider Italy the continent, So th because we are physically separated. I mean, in Sicily, the separation is teeny tiny, but in Sardinia, it's not. So I believe that going back to our Sicilian friends, that Sicily is itself, it's a continent, it's Italy and it's not Italy. So it's uh, uh, why so many people love Sicily because it's so diverse, but at the same time, uh, there is such a, a common ground that everybody, almost everybody I, I travel with to Sicily found themselves in them, in their generosity, in their um, uh, pride of being a Sicilian, uh, so it, it's really an incredible mix. And that's something that makes Sicily and Italy, I have to add, uh, extremely interesting for uh, foreigners, for people that they, they're not from here, they're not from, from Italy, they're not from Sicily. And even among Italians, there are many coming from different parts of, of, the, of the country that they feel attracted deeply to Sicily. I think part of what really attracts at least me, but I think a lot of people to Sicily that they don't understand to start with is that Sicily isn't Italy. It's not. It may be a part of the country, but it, it isn't even from a biological point of view because the people who live there are the product of what 17, 18 different dominations of cultures. So they are truly kind of pan European. You know, they're going to be part North African and Arab, they're going to be part French, they're going to be part Greek. There's this incredible melting pot sort of um, uh, culture there that I think is very unexpected. Most people that arrive in Sicily think, oh, this is going to be yet another Italian region. It'll be, you know, it'll be just like Italy. And then you get there and there's just even even if you don't know anything about Sicily, you can feel just the, the feeling of everything about it is is different all the way down to the language, because the language, Sicilian, is not even a dialect of Italian. It is its own language, right? So it is. Yeah. Um, so just, I, I'm curious, because it is so very, very different. And it, it feels to me almost like a separate country. I think of it in my own head as a separate country. Is that how Italians view that? Is that somebody, you as a, as a mainlander, do you think of Sicily as almost like a different country? Well, I, I have to uh, say yes and no. Yes, because I know uh, the diversity that the island has in terms of, uh, as you said, dominations, food, language, etc. But at the same time, I have to say that, uh, you know, I mentioned that I was in Sicily for the first time when I was uh, 12, 13 years old, so many, many years ago. I have to say that in those few decades from since my first um, visit in Sicily, uh, certain things changed. And one of the main uh, uh, unifier, if you pass me the word, has been the uh, television. So television, uh, not only for the South, not only for Sicily, but television uh, that started in the, the 50s with Rai, with uh, one or two channels at the very beginning. So Rai, for those who don't know, is the uh, Radio Televisione Italiana. So the, it's the Italian public TV, okay? And today they have uh, uh, several channels, but they started with one. Um, and it was in black and white. And it was a way to uh, finally have someone 
speaking to you about the rest of the country that you did not know, okay, because you didn't travel more than a few miles inside and outside your little uh, town or big town, okay, and uh, listening to people speaking in proper Italian helped the unification of Italy, according to my humble opinion, more the unification itself that happened at the end uh, in the second half of the 1800s. So we had several unifications because as uh, you probably, you know for sure, but I don't know if wh whoever is watching us know, but Italy is, uh, as Italy, a very recent uh, democracy, a very recent country. So we were united in 1860, 61. So we're talking about 170 years ago. So it's uh, it's really uh, a very short uh, time, considering that the history of the Italian peninsula is incredibly ancient, okay? Um, so going back to yes and no, yes, they're part of Italy, thanks to this um, open uh, possibility. First of all, TV, Second, uh, the, the fact that we could travel and we, we improved the, the transportation, you know, uh, between Sicily and Italy. Actually, improved is a big word, but let's say it's uh, rather uh, <laughs> uh, okay now. Uh, so there are flights, there are cheap flights. Uh, Catania and Palermo are the main airports connecting Milan and Rome. Uh, and of course, you have the ferry and you have trains that they have to be put on ferries for the strait from Messina yep. to Calabria and then back again on tracks, which is a fascinating thing. And I, uh, I know that some of my uh, friends and, and clients, they were uh, absolutely shocked to see that a, a train was put on a, on a ferry. I think you, you did that too, I Sarah, that don't you? I, you know, on all the years I've been coming and going from Sicily, I've always just taken a flight because it's so cheap. Yeah. It's only like, it's less than an hour from, from Rome. Yeah. So it's really easy to just hop on a flight. But then I, when I had this did this epic road trip with my kids and we drove to Sicily, um, we kind of spontaneously just decided one day we just needed to get there because we had um, like plans that night. And so we took the ferry and the car ferry was hilarious. It was so much fun. And so after that experience of going on the car ferry, you know, I do ferries, I'm in Seattle. I do ferries all the time here, but they're way tighter and a lot more Italian <laughs> going to Sicily. <laughs> I got a taste of that and thought that was wild. And so I, on my way back from Sicily this summer, when I went down, um, I came back uh, to back up to see you. Uh, I thought, well, instead of flying, I think I'm going to take the train. I have time. I'm in no hurry. Yeah, and it was. It was fascinating, and it took for for freaking ever. Oh my goodness, Sicilians. Let me just tell you, they run on their own time. They have their True. own clock. It's island time all the way, and it took more than an hour just to load the ferry, basically, <laughs> on each side. I believe you. <laughs> individual car they back onto the the ferry and then eventually you know that you you can get out if you're on the train and you can get, walk around the ferry it's just a ridiculous it's almost comically long considering that you can look across the straits of messina and you can yes. practically touch the mainland <laughs> yeah you can true well you know the one of the um never ending projects there were not one many uh, over the years was to connect italy uh, actually Calabria to Sicily through uh, this famous uh, or unfamous uh, bridge uh, and they uh, they had so many projects and actually so much money was um, wasted <laughs> or not used to uh, to do something that probably in other parts of the world the starting from the state they would have done uh, decades ago but you know the the the, the idea of creating a, a bridge in between uh, the the strait of messina and calabria the mainland has been on our mind uh, forever and actually on the minds of many of our politicians that even recently i don't remember who was uh, who said uh, yes and uh, in our list uh, we want to uh, create the bridge um, between summer. calabria yeah no that yes. was Summer. And I read the Sicilian newspaper every morning, and I swear to you, at least once a week, there's an article in yeah. the Sicilian newspapers about, oh yeah, we're still doing that. And I'm just like, <laughs> you guys, come on, give it up. Like you've been talking yeah. about 
how many years and you still haven't done it. And I think that there is a desire to do it because it certainly would make a lot of things easier. But I think at the same time, there's a desire not to do it, honestly. I think Sicilians like being their own thing. I think they like kind of secretly, they like being kind of different and isolated. And I don't know, I think there's a mixed feeling about that, about what that would mean for the Sicilianita. You know, what are you if you are attached to the mainland? Well, can be, but um, you have to, you cannot forget that the main, main problem, and this is something that it's, it's like a disease that we have in Italy from north to south, is the bureaucracy. So once you have a project, you have to submit, but you know, the, the way to do it, it's pretty common in, uh, in, in every single country, in every country all over the world. The problem is that in, in Italy, there is this surplus of bureaucracy and who do you have to pay under the table to get certain things done or not done, okay? So that is something that actually, uh, going back to uh, why uh, Sicily is different. Yes, Sicily is different from Italy, but we have a common ground for good and bad. And the bad thing is the excess of bureaucracy that we as Italians from North to South, we all suffer. Okay, yeah. so this is one of the common things we have. Then we have to say that the, um, no matter what you where you live, bureaucracy will be part of your life, but can be heavier or easier, so lighter, depending on the single um, regions, towns, little towns. Sometimes uh, some uh, towns are more efficient than others because. It really depends on the mayor. It really depends on uh, being uh, more honest or less dishonest and also getting the public money to do something public and not to put them uh, in your pockets. So this is, a, this is something that really can change. So Italy, it is small. It's a small country compared to many others and especially compared to the States, but the diversity is such in a way that we are so different but there are certain things that we are all the same. So we all suffer for certain things that they, they became almost like a, a national disease, bureaucracy, number one, I, I'd say. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I have to say that, you know, I've been traveling in Sicily for, I think I, the first time it was more than a decade ago. And the way I look at my experience in Sicily is in my, in my soul, I call it the great education because I had been in Italy for 15 years, more than that, before I ever arrived in Sicily. And what I realized when I arrived there is I didn't really know, and I had to start from zero in the sense that the culture was so different. But oh, yeah. it also, there, there's something about that culture that reflects back at the person visiting. So it was sort of like the education that I received from spending time in Sicily was not just that I had to start over with history because the history has nothing to do with Italian history. It's completely different. But also, I think it gives you an opportunity to, to look back at your own self. How do you present yourself in the world? Because Sicilians are very honest and they'll give you a lot of feedback. <laughs> they tell you exactly what they think of you. <laughs> For me, it has been a, the greatest the greatest cultural and spiritual and self-education too, just like how do people see me in the world and how, how do I communicate with people in a different culture in the appropriate way? Like, I think as Americans, we just sort of go out there and we're like, here I am, I'm traveling and I'm meeting new cultures. But it, we don't often take the time to go, what is that impression that we're leaving with other people? And that was really beat into me early in Sicily is you have to be careful about the way, the way you present yourself is everything, right? And, you know, I know that that's important in Italy, but in Sicily, it feels even more so. So it's just one of these interesting things that I, I would say, that's why we chose this book, right? Is yes. that I think that yes. uh, this book, it, that Sicily was for me in my life, the great educator. I learned more than I've learned in my life about anything, about myself, about culture, about history. Uh, and so this is why we chose Camilleri. So tell me a little bit about why we why we chose this book together what are your thoughts on why we chose this book well first of all i have to tell you that i i knew that you like camilleri and of course sicily as we just discussed um a lot so i said why not uh choosing something that it's uh it's a way to show uh the country or the the island 
uh, with in a in a very uh, critical but good critical eye because Camilleri Camilleri is uh, for me it's an exceptional uh, writer um, he died uh, in 2019 at the age of 93 uh, he was practically blind uh, still smoking one cigarette after the other didn't care about that and he was still uh, pretty lucid and uh, a very smart and a very sharp mind. Um, he started that he was already um, a middle-aged man uh, to write in 1994, uh, The Shape of Water was released. And uh, The Shape of Water, uh, I chose it because it was the first book, not by Camilleri, but by Camilleri uh, writing about Montalbano, this character that became uh, a world on his own. So uh, Inspector Montalbano was, uh, the books were translated in 130 different languages all over the world. He wrote in this very prolific and long life because dying in 93 is not so common. He wrote uh, uh, over 40 books on only on Montalbano and a hundred on different topics because this was the first one that he wrote on uh, Montalbano, but it was not his first book. Um, by the way he wrote this book, you can understand, in my opinion, that he had a very solid career also as a director for theater. And in fact, it's not a coincidence that he met many years before uh, the, uh, the future um, actor that was going to impersonate uh, Montalbano for over 20 years. Actually, I just read in the newspapers that uh, this spring, the coming spring 2021, there will be probably one episode, the last episode of uh, the TV series that's starting in 2000. So we're talking about 1994, the first book uh, about Montalbano by Camilleri. 2000, 1999, 2000, they started to shoot the episodes uh, promoted uh, um, and commissioned by Rai, the uh, Italian TV. And uh, it was about, uh, for the last 20 years, one, uh, no, two or three episodes every season. And you know, the incredible thing is that uh, this book was a big hit and all the others that came, he was already, as I told you, not, not a young man, but uh, he became a reference, like uh, uh, we read today, uh, you know, Agatha Christie, uh, as we read, uh, um, you know, Simenon, uh, in, uh, translated also in Italian, many other languages. So he became, he created his, his own niche. Uh, and uh, this character and all the side characters that uh, um, Camilleri created, they became real, real because of the TV series, but they, they became, uh, you, you say, uh, bigger than life or larger than life. So uh, incredible. Uh, it, was, uh, it was one of those uh, um, things that, you know, at the, the publisher and uh, uh, a publishing house in Palermo, Sellerio, uh, at the beginning, I think they, they were surprised that even people who don't usually read books, they were starting to uh, to read Camilleri. And well, it's so uh, the enjoyable, that's why. I mean, and that's why I think this is such a great way for people to start reading Camilleri because this is this is not The Shape of Water. This is another one of the books, but they're, they're quite thin. They're short, yeah. they're easy to read, and they're funny. And that's the thing that I just think we could really use. This is why I love this idea of reading Camilleri because right now in the depths of COVID and winter and people are stuck in their homes and we haven't seen the sun in months, at least here in Seattle, you want to yeah. look the sunshine in your soul. You want Sicily for sure for the sunshine and you want the, the kind of subtle humor. I mean, the, the humor in these books it, it's they're so funny and they're funny because they they poke a, a lot of fun at the truths about Italians, but they also poke a lot of fun at the truths about life and about people yes. in general. And one thing I wanted to mention actually is that um, Camilleri comes from an area in Sicily that is rich with writers. And I've always been curious about why, I mean, there must be something in the water down there, but it's- <laughs> 
I mean, it's the area down um, near Agrigento. Um, he's yes. from um, Porto Empedocle, which is uh, kind of a big port town on the south coast of Sicily. And there's Pirandello, there's Shasha, there's all these really incredible famous writers that come from this little tiny zone that's not even the most populated part of Sicily. So I don't know, what do you think about, why is that? Is that because there's a lot of sun and good food? I don't know, I don't get it. <laughs> Well, you know, if uh, for that reason, I mean, uh, they, we should have incredible writers all over. And actually, we do have a, a quite high ratio of uh, good writers. But my um, humble opinion on that, because I, I don't know for sure, is that when you set the bar high, as uh, Pirandello uh, had, had done, for example, for the, that area, because uh, he was from the Agrigentano, so from the era of Agrigento, uh, is that uh, no matter who is coming after, he will look at you as, as a source of inspiration. It's not a coincidence that, for example, you know, uh, great restaurants or great writers or uh, great film directors, sometimes they come or they have a common base um, and they have a source of inspiration in the very same places. So in the case of Pirandello, um, as much as uh, Camilleri, is that, you know, Camilleri lived uh, a big chunk of his life in Rome. And in fact, he died in Rome and he's buried in a, actually a super quaint, beautiful place that I'd like to show you one day, which is the, um, the A Catholic Cemetery in Rome, which is uh, in the section of Testaccio. Uh, very close to the pyramid, the pyramid Cestia. And uh, uh, so despite the fact that this man spent a huge amount of time and many of his uh, uh, years of a long life in, uh, in Rome, he never lost the connection with Sicily. He never lost the connection with uh, Porto Empedocle, with the, the area of Agrigento. And in fact, he was uh, traveling back and forth um, to, from Rome to Sicily and also to other parts uh, because he was uh, uh, not only prolific writing, but he was uh, very prolific with theater, with plays, and he was participating to many um, uh, interviews and shows on TV. Uh, so he was uh, regarded as, a, I don't want to say a follower, uh, but of Pirandello, because we're talking about different times, but also different style, um, deeply different styles. But of course, the source of inspiration was there. And I believe, I, I don't want to say uh, lie to, to people, but I believe that he met, uh, he probably, because he was born in 1925, he probably met um, uh, Pirandello. I would, I would have to think so since they are in the same line of work. But just to kind of back up just a little bit for people watching that don't know a lot about Camilleri's story, he has such a fascinating story. You can correct me if I'm not remembering this exactly right, but he was uh, in the theater, as you, as you mentioned. He didn't start writing until he was in his, what, like 60s or 70s. That was like when he started writing novels, <laughs> which I find yeah. as a writer, really encouraging because I'm like in my 40s and I still <laughs> haven't written my great novel yet. And it's like, wow, he started then. And then the other point that you mentioned in the story, which I think is fascinating, is uh, Luca Zingaretti. Is that how you say it? Is that yeah, Luca Zingaretti. Luca Zingaretti. So first of all, for those watching, you just have to understand that in, in Italy, um, Montalbano, Salvo Montalbano, who was the main character in this entire series, is the Sherlock Holmes of Italy, basically. He's I mean, you could say the modern day Sherlock Holmes of, of yeah. Italy and everybody in Italy knows his books. Any bookstore you go to in Italy is going to have a huge selection of the whole series. There's a ton of these and they're serials very much like Sherlock Holmes. So it is kind of a modern day Sicilian yeah. Sherlock Holmes. So what's interesting is that because Camilleri worked in the theater and he was coaching people and I, I don't remember if it was people who had just gotten out of jail or something like this, but he was coaching people who were kind of special needs populations on acting to give them something positive to contribute to the community. And that's how he met Luca Zingaretti, who then he went on to cast as Montalbano and he's done it for 20 years. And this guy, you guys are gonna have, after you don't read the book first, don't yes. watch the movie, yes. read the book first. It's easy, it's fast, you can read it. Then watch the TV show, it is in Italian but it has subtitles. Yes. And um, 
this guy is so spot on. It's not who I saw in my head, actually, when Me I read. Me neither. No? What, okay, tell me, who did you see in your head the first time you read a, a Montalbano book? You know, I started to read Montalbano not right, uh, right from the start, from 1994, but just a few years later. So just before the TV series start started, and uh, in my mind, he was uh, physically, it was different, taller, hair, so more like, um, I don't know, certain ideas, uh, also stereotypes that we have about um, Sicilian or Italian. So um, olive skin, black hair, um, uh, not bald as, as uh, Luca Zingaretti is. But then when I started to watch this, the, the series, the TV shows, and at the same time I was reading the books because mostly what I did was uh, to read the books and then watch the TV series. Uh, but you can do whatever you want, of course. I started to like him. I started to, as you said, spot on. Really, uh, it makes sense that he chose, or I don't know, they mutually chose each other because uh, Luca Zingaretti, despite the fact that doesn't have, he's not, first of all, he's not Sicilian. so he had to somehow force and learn an accent. Um, Could have fooled me. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah right. but it sounds Sicilian to me when I listen to him. So yeah, he's he's good in that case. I didn't realize he's he was. He's good, he's good. But of course, if you ask the average Sicilian, he would, they would probably say, no, no way. But anyway, despite that, he was so good. And actually, he uh, when uh, when Camilleri died, uh, I just read it today, he wrote on his personal uh, Facebook page a beautiful uh, message to him. And he called him maestro because, uh, in, in fact, he considered uh, Camilleri like a master. And, you know, uh, working uh, elbow to elbow and for so many years, uh, for the past 20 years. So it, it's, uh, and even the crew that they created, uh, uh, apart from Livia, yes, that changed three times, uh, but they're the same, the same people, the same actors that they became, they aged, they became older, but they're still playing the same role. So to me, it's a, it's extraordinary, um, almost like a holy matrimony. So the, the, the TV series, with the actors, with Camilleri supervising. And you know that for every single new episode uh, that was released, and there was a massive amount of people watching the new episode of Montalbano, there was a preface uh, or a pre-interview. I don't know if I, I, I said something that doesn't, that doesn't exist, but there was an interview to Montalbano, not uh, um, saying something about what was going to happen, but explaining a little bit the plot of the new episode. So he was the one to be interviewed. And for a long time, I mean, I love to see uh, the new episode, but I, especially I love to listen to Camilleri, what he had to say about his own creature that from a book became a movie or a TV um, a show. So that was great. So I think that that's just something to keep in mind for those of you who are going to be reading these these books is that they you should read the books first, but then yeah, yes. for sure. What's beautiful about the series is that then you get the overlay of these beautiful destinations in Sicily, and some of this the books actually the the shows were actually set in destinations places in Sicily that the book doesn't actually talk about. Like one of them was set in the Grotta del Manja, which is a really cool cave with a village inside. And it's not something that was mentioned in the book, but they they use that. I just wanted to kind of um, give you guys an example. For those of you watching, if you're not sure, if you're on the fence about whether or not you wanna jump into this book, one of the reasons, well, I would say the reason I love Camilleri and I love these books so much is the little window into the Sicilian soul that they open because Sicilians, in my view, are pretty complicated, and there's it's because of their history, it's because of their you know their relationship to Italy, and there's just a lot of reasons that Sicilians have these very complicated souls. And just as an as a scene, this is not from The Shape of Water, the one we're going to read, but there's another book um, later on that you can read. And the opening scene of the book, I think, is I, I just remember this so well. These there's a dead body in an elevator, and everybody gets into the elevator and rides the elevator to their apartment and they just step over the dead body and they don't call the police. And so that's how the mystery starts is who killed this guy? What were the circumstances of his death? And how come every person in the apartment building didn't call the police, but instead stepped over the, the dead body? And so the whole book is just exploring 
all the reasons that people had for not wanting to call the police. <laughs> which I love that. I can't remember which one it was, but that's what that's my favorite scene, my favorite setup in <laughs> analytic books because it was it's so funny and so true that each of them has has their own set of secrets. They each have their own mystery within their family and their social life that they just didn't want exposed, you know. And uh, that just felt true to me. Um, so that's my favorite scene from any of the Camilleri books. Do you have a, a favorite scene from any of the, of the books you've read? Well, actually there are many. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a um, uh, cliche scene, but uh, to me, um, uh, it's uh, when uh, he's swimming and when you see the sea. You know, for many years I lived in Madrid and Madrid is everything but the sea. So uh, I don't regret my years. I don't regret uh, what I did there, all, all the friends I met. But after a while, I, I since in Rome we have the sea, it's not in Rome, but it's pretty close. And you can always go, even by car, you take a little train and you can be by the sea. Um, I feel that the most uh, uh, beautiful scenes are the ones, and sometimes romantic, sometimes melancholic, because yes, uh, the, uh, the irony and the sense of humor uh, are always in every single book. But then, since we're talking about murders and we're talking about people that kill other people for various reasons, uh, but the bottom line is that since Montalbano is a very fair man and he hates uh, hypocritical people, he hates uh, uh, when uh, strong people, they try to push hard on weak people. There is a melancholy, uh, that a melancholia, I don't know if you say that, uh, of his character. So to me, the best scenes are the ones that they're shot actually in another area it's always the southern part of Sicily, but not exactly um, where, uh, from where um, Camilleri was from. So Porto Empedocle, where he was born, in the, is in the southern western part of uh, Sicily. And uh, the, uh, the Italian TV, when they designed the, um, the episodes, they decided to recreate Vigata. Vigata is the name of this uh, fictional imaginary place that he invented, uh, placing uh, the, uh, the characters in Vigata, which is uh, uh, in the area of Ragusa, so uh, in the Ragusano, so southern east part of Sicily. And uh, uh, Montalbano lives in, a, in an apartment that all I, all I wanted in my life was to live in the same place because he opened his windows and here he has a, the beach and the, um, the sea. So for me, the moments that when he has to think about things or recover from uh, a bad discovery of, or from uh, the, the cruelness of human nature, what does he do? He takes a swim. A swim. So for me, that image of uh, an island surrounded by water yeah. is what I like the most. That's I would for say sure. Just, I'm a little bit of a purist in this sense, and that's my big disagreement with uh, with the whole series. Is I think that it's a disservice to the Agrigento area that they filmed a lot of it and they set a lot of that stuff in the Ragusa area, which is a. It's like those are like completely different countries, practically. I mean, the scenery is different, the people are different. So I, I would disagree with the Italians on that, that they should have set, they should have filmed it all in the Agrigento area. But I have a couple of other topics I wanted to just get to before we run out of time is that I wanted to um, touch on the, the fact that, you know, when people think of Sicily, they think of the mafia, of course. And so you may be thinking, well, if we're gonna be reading murder mysteries set in Sicily, they must, it must be mafia, right? Like machine guns and like all that kind of thing. And there are mentions of that, but that's not the focus of the books, right? Yes, actually, it's a very subtle way to talk about something that it's not uh, a disease or a problem, a serious problem in Sicily, but it's a problem of uh, uh, the entire peninsula. And to be honest, uh, I would say the entire world because the mafia now it's like a big holding. So having diverse businesses and of course, Today, mafiosi, they send their kids to the best uh, um, schools in America um, to study business 
because of course we are not talking about the the guns and uh, like uh, the uh, the challenge of uh, the okay corral so you know the, the, there was an evolution there is still an evolution in course of the mafia so they have diverse businesses and they want to their kids to be prepared to face uh, the new business but the mafia i would say that it's one of the um uh, backdrops uh, one of the uh, uh, characters without being a real character of every single almost every single book of montalbano uh, so camilleri doesn't speak Wait, that is such a good characterization. Thank you for saying that because I couldn't figure out how to express it, but that's exactly it. It's like a character, but it's yes. not, but it's a diffused character. You're right. Yes. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yes, because in reality, we know already since we start from book number one and then going on, uh, th th there are two big clans, two big families that they're facing and uh, fighting on the territory, the territory of, of uh, that specific part of Sicily. But in reality, there are moments in which uh, the, the mafia boss is even helping and facilitating Montalbano uh, with the solution of a specific murder. And you may wonder, why is that? Because um, this specific boss, but it happened in the past, in real life, uh, was uh, uh, I, I was a, a big fan from the other side of the barrier of Montalbano. Montalbano is a man that is respected, high, re, highly respected by uh, common people, usually uh, the weaks, the the weakest uh, people, but also by people that they are in in the wrong business. So uh, like enemies. And why is that? Because he's a fair man, and he's uh, is one of those who has a grumpy attitude. Sometimes he's a meteopathico. So as we say, he his moods uh, will change according to the weather. So if he opens the window and it's raining, you know that he's going to have a bad day. <laughs> so that's for sure. But then uh, he can be extremely fair, and he can relate, and he can make a relationship almost with everybody. So let's say the mafia is one of the, 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 the backdrop of, uh, like of the characters, but in reality, he talks about Sicily, he talks about Italy. And uh, uh, for me, every single novel of Camilleri is a metaphor of life. You know, Camilleri himself was a very cultured man. He was uh, highly educated. In fact, his commissario, his uh, Montalbano, uh, in many cases, he will solve and will have the solution thinking about movies or important books that he read in the past. Um, so he's a, he's a man of action, but also he's a man of a high, very fine intellectual uh, power, okay? Uh, so I would say that every single uh, episode, uh, you see a little bit the evolution of the characters, the evolution of Montalbano that is getting older, uh, also, the evolution of the relationship with Livia, this eternal uh, girlfriend that never, they will never marry, but, you know, it's an important pillar of his life. And, uh, you know, I believe that this first introduction to Montalbano, um, it's important. And also the, ch the, the choice um, that um, Camilleri does with titles. For me, uh, this title... Uh, that he chose for the first book, it's very important. And I would like to read and translate something from the Italian version that it's like this, this one. So I have uh, the English and I have the Italian one and basically says, uh, which is the shape of water? But water doesn't have shape. Um, it takes the shape according to the container. And this is uh, uh, a metaphor of uh, reality and truth and the facts. So there is a fact, something is going to be murder, but then the shape of the container, so the shape of water will change according to the container. And from one container to the other, we will get to the truth because this is the only important thing in the end that because really matters. Everybody who experiences or is involved in this investigation of the murder has a completely different perception of what happened, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And actually, it is uh, uh, the 
complexity of the investigation that will lead us to understand the truth. But you know, the truth in many cases, uh, and this one is one of the many examples, the truth is always uh, like a, a bitter drink, very bitter drink for Mortabano because he's always uh, um, so shocked by the cruelty and the, uh, the lack of humanity that sometimes people can show. Um, so it, it's, it's really difficult. And I would like to, uh, to end on my side saying that you mentioned that um, our Sherlock is uh, without any doubt uh, the Inspector Montalbano. And in fact, uh, as we all know that uh, Bond, uh, you know, you say Bond, James Bond, you know, there, is, uh, there are many phrases and there are many ways of saying things that they became so popular that they come from this mixing between the Sicilian language and the Italian language. And there is a way that uh, Montalbano always uses when he uh, replies on the phone and say, Montalbano sono. So I am Montalbano. So our Bond, James Bond will be Montalbano sono. <laughs> this is very typical. Oh, that's funny. I never made that, that connection, but you're right. That is like Bond, James Bond. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here I am. <laughs> yeah. So I would say just uh, to kind of encourage people who are watching to read the book, um, my pitch to you is just that I think that, um, as I said, Sicily has provided me with one of the greatest educations out there. I would say it's the great education of my life on so many different levels because it's such a soulful culture. It's so complicated. And the thing about it is that incredible complication of the culture and of the way people think and everybody has a different approach. I, I would say probably the thing I take away from Sicilian culture is the thing that we find in the books, which is that it is that shape of water. It's that gray area. How really, you know, everything is a little bit relative. Everybody sees things a little bit different way and right versus wrong. It's not always clear and it's not always the same for everybody. And that's very much a way, a Sicilian way of looking at things is that everything is kind of relative in, in a sense and not to judge people by their choices because you just never know what the motivating factors are because there's a lot of a lot going on. So I guess it's sort of um, a subtlety in the way you approach things and people and places that Montalbano has, the way he's able to kind of um, get to people's motivations. You know, it's not always clear what their motivations are, even if it looks like it is. And that's what I love about these books, because that rings true to me about the Sicilian people. You don't always know their motivations and you have to dig a little bit deeper to find out because sometimes it's extremely complicated, right? Yes, so, yes absolutely. Yeah, so my hope by people reading Montalbano is that you really are able to connect with the idea of what it is for people to be Sicilian in this world and also, my number one motivation, as always, for promoting Sicily is I want people to have a sympathy for the place and I want you to throw the godfather away. <laughs> that is not <laughs> Sicily. And please stop thinking that Sicily. I won't, it is a beautiful place with 3000 years of history with some of the most fascinating artists and writers, architecture. It really is one of the most magical places that you can ever go. And I would love for people to have more of an appreciation. So I think and I think you would agree with me, Susanna, Camilleri is a good foot in the door for people that don't know anything about Sicily, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I would make it mandatory to read at least four or five books of Camilleri before getting to Sicily. But of course, we have to add that uh, the Sicilian uh, list of writers is really, really long. So yeah. uh, whoever is interested, and actually we can probably facilitate next time um, during the, the, the real book club, because this has been just um, an introduction, uh, kind of a list of books that they can read uh, from Sicily, about Sicily, written by Sicilian people of the present and the past. Of course, we all know now Camilleri, but Camilleri is, uh, you know, the child of many others. So what you were saying before, Sarah, how come that so many people uh, or incredible writers come from a specific area? I believe it's like, um, it's like for, you know, when we talk about uh, Florence and the Renaissance, ooh, it's extraordinary that, you know, so many gifted artists were there at the same time or just a, a few decades before, a few decades after to produce such great art. Well, it's not a coincidence because they had money, 
they had power, and they had a common way to see the world, which was art is also a way to convey a message. Yeah. So I want to be surrounded by the best artists of the world, which means that in that moments where Michelangelo, uh, Giotto, we're talking about different moments, uh, okay, Donatello, uh, Ghiberti, etc., and so on and so on. So it, it's uh, it's never a coincidence. So if we stop thinking, and we, if we start digging, we will find uh, always an explanation. And the explanation, in many cases, can be found knowing uh, the deep roots of the history of that place and uh, people so because we are what we are thanks or because of uh, the, the the course of history that brought us there so uh, camilleri from this point of view uh, can be judged as, as a sicilian writer as he was but also it's uh, much bigger than that because uh, the problems that you see in the books uh, and he talks about Italy, about bureaucracy, about uh, certain things that they're exactly the same uh, from north to south. So it can be expanded from Sicily to the world because in the end, people are people and we are moved by the same good feelings, bad feelings, you know? So once you know the human soul, uh, you understand why bad things happen. And that's exactly what Montalbano every single time is obliged to witness, to witness that greed and uh, anger and uh, hate and uh, many other uh, things move people uh, or the greed for power, to have more power, move people uh, and uh, till the extreme consequences such as a murder for example. Excellent. Well, I think that we are going to have a lot to talk about this month. So those of you who are um, who are watching, uh, we are going to get back with you guys. Uh, I hope at least once a week, Susanna and I will be um, doing some other things about Sicily just to kind of keep you in the Sicilian frame of mind. Uh, I know Susanna would like to take you perhaps to see Camilleri's grave, if that's possible. We'll see if, if that yeah. reopens. Uh, and we'll get, we'll kind of give you a, a little bit more information about Sicily. I've got acres of writing. I did co-author the <laughs> Sicily book, so I have so much writing you wouldn't even believe it. So I'd love to share some of my writing about Sicily with you uh, to kind of help to spark your imagination about this. And if you are interested or have any questions, you can certainly uh, message uh, Susanna and I through Guide Collective, also through uh, yes. Adventures with Sarah, as you wish. And we'd love to have a conversation with you. So when we get together with book for book club um, for the final meeting, that's going to be a Zoom. We're going to have anybody who's reading the book, you can be on the Zoom call with us. And what Susanna and I just talked about before we started is that our book club meeting, we'd really love it to be a discussion amongst everybody. So we're going to really have you guys be involved in the conversation. We'll lead it and we'll kind of help you guys out. We're probably going to have a special guest as well. Uh, but we'd really like your interaction and involvement and to hear your voices as well, because we'd love to see what you thought about uh, Camuleri as well. So Absolutely. this is a different one here, but just so you know, the spelling of his name, there's the spelling of his name, Andrea Camuleri. And how many books total are there? Well, I think uh, about 40 because he also made collections, okay? So I would say, yes, uh, around 40 of a hundred that he wrote because he had uh, also another line, which is the historical uh, novel. Very interesting as well. And there's one more coming out, I believe that was going, or has come out that was written. Has come by, out, has come has, out. Okay. Um, by yes, the, because when Camilleri, when Camilleri died, it was uh, in 2019 and in July of the next year. So July, July, 2020, um, it was released the last book called Riccardino. So the name did not change. He wrote the book uh, many years uh, before in 2005 and retouched in 2016. So it's a book that he already had in his pocket. He gave it to Celerio, the publishing house saying, I don't want to die before my character. So um, he said, I already have the last uh, story, the last novel. 
Oh, that's wonderful. So there, it is possible to read all the way to the end. So now we've given oh, yes. this project for the rest of the, the COVID lockdown. So Absolutely. we'll see everybody back here on the 22nd of February at 11 a.m. Yes. And if you would like to participate in the call and be on screen, you want to join the Guide Collective Book Club and you can uh, email us at uh, theguidecollective at gmail.com and we'll get you onto that list. Uh, and look forward to what Suzanne and I come up with to entertain you about Sicily. We hope to really spark your interest about this place. It's a great passion for both of us. So hopefully so. Let's cross fingers yeah. <laughs> that many people read, read the book. So, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Susanna. I, I have to tell you. My pleasure has been like oxygen for me because I haven't gotten a chance to talk or think about Sicily in a long time. It's been a few months and it really is life to me that I mean, there's something about that place that just gives me life. And I think it does to you too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So we'll see everybody again in three weeks. Enjoy Ciao. the book and we'll see you. Uh, see you then. Thanks a lot. Ciao. Ciao. To the next time. Arrivederci. Buona